Chapter 37 The South Pole I rushed on to the platform. Yes, the open sea, with but a few scattered pieces of ice and moving icebergs, a long stretch of sea, a world of birds in the air, and myriads of fishes under those waters which varied from intense blue to olive green, according to the bottom. The thermometer marked three degrees centigrade above zero. It was comparatively spring, shut up as we were behind this iceberg whose lengthened mass was dimly seen on our northern horizon. Are we at the pole? I asked the captain with a beating heart. I do not know, he replied. At noon I will take our bearings. But will the sun show himself through this fog, said I, looking at the leaden sky? However little it shows, it will be enough, replied the captain. About ten miles south, a solitary island rose to a height of one hundred and four yards. We made for it, but carefully, for the sea might be strewn with banks. One hour afterward we had reached it, two hours later we had made the round of it. It measured four or five miles in circumference, a narrow canal separated it from a considerable stretch of land perhaps a continent, for we could not see its limits. The existence of this land seemed to give some color to Maury's hypotheses. The ingenious American has remarked that between the South Pole and the 60th parallel, the sea is covered with floating ice of enormous size, which is never met with in the North Atlantic. From this fact he has drawn the conclusion that the Antarctic Circle encloses considerable continents. As icebergs cannot form an open sea, but only on the coasts. According to these calculations, the mass of ice surrounding the southern pole forms a vast cap, the circumference of which must be at least 2,500 miles. But the Nautilus, for fear of running aground, had stopped about three cables' length from a strand over which reared a superb heap of rocks. The boat was launched, the captain, two of his men bearing instruments, Conseil and myself, were in it. It was ten in the morning. I had not seen Ned Land. Doubtless the Canadian did not wish to admit the presence of the South Pole. A few strokes of the oar brought us to the sand where we ran ashore. Conseil was going to jump on the land when I held him back. Sir, said I to Captain Nemo, to you belongs the honor of first setting foot on this land. Yes, sir said the captain, and if I do not hesitate to tread this South Pole, it is because up to this time no human being has left a trace there. Saying this, he jumped lightly on the sand, his heart beat with emotion. He climbed the rock, sloping to a little promontory, and there with his arms crossed, mute and motion lessened with an eager look he seemed to take possession of these southern regions. After five minutes passed in this ecstasy, he turned to us. When you like, sir. I landed, followed by Conseil, leaving the two men in the boat. For a long way the soil was composed of a reddish, sandy stone, something like crushed brick scoriae, streams of lava and pumice stones. One could not mistake its volcanic origin. In some parts, slight curls of smoke emitted a sulfurous smell, 
proving that the internal fires had lost nothing of their expansive powers, though, having climbed the high acclivity, I could see no volcano for a radius of several miles. We know that in those Antarctic countries, James Ross found two craters, the Erebus and Terra in full activity on the 167th meridian, latitude 77 degrees 32 minutes. The vegetation of this desolate continent seemed to me much restricted. Some lichens of the species Asnia melanoxanta lay upon the black rocks. Some microscopic plants, rudimentary diatomas, a kind of Cells placed between two quartz shells. Long purple and scarlet fucus supported on little swimming bladders, which the breaking of the waves brought to the shore. These constituted the meager flora of this region, and particularly some clios with oblong, membranous bodies, the head of which was formed of two rounded lobes. I also saw myriads of northern clios, one and a quarter inches long, and of which a whale would swallow a whole world and a mouthful, and some charming tarot pots, perfect sea butterflies animating the waters on the skirts of the shore. About half a mile further on, the soil was riddled with rough nests, a sort of laying ground out of which many birds were issuing. Captain Nemo had some hundreds hunted. They uttered a cry like the braying of an ass, were about the size of a goose, slate color on the body, white beneath with a yellow line round their throats. They allowed themselves to be killed with a stone, never trying to escape. But the fog did not lift, and at eleven the sun had not yet shown itself. Its absence made me uneasy. Without it no observations were possible. How, then, could we decide whether we had reached the pole? When I rejoined Captain Nemo I found him leaning on a piece of rock, silently watching the sky. He seemed impatient and vexed. But what was to be done? This rash and powerful man could not command the sun as he did the sea. Noon arrived without the orb of day, showing itself for an instant. We could not even tell its position, and behind the curtain of fog, and soon the fog turned to snow. Till tomorrow, said the captain quietly, and we returned to the Nautilus amid these troublesome atmospheric disturbances. The tempest of snow continued till the next day. It was impossible to remain on the platform. From the saloon, where I was taking notes of incidents happening during this excursion to the polar continent, I could hear the cries of petrels and albatrosses sporting in the midst of this violent storm. The Nautilus did not remain motionless, but skirted the coast, advancing ten miles more to the south, in the half-light left by the sun as it skirted the edges of the horizon. The next day, the 20th of March, the snow had ceased. The cold was a little greater, the thermometer showing two degrees below zero. The fog was rising, and I hoped that that day our observation might be taken. Captain Nemo not having yet appeared, the boat took Conseil and myself to land. The soil was still of the same volcanic nature. Everywhere were traces of lava, scoriae, and basalt, but the crater which had vomited them I could not see. Here, as lower down, this continent was alive with myriads of birds, but their rule 
was now divided with large troops of sea mammals looking at us with their soft eyes. There were several kinds of seals, some stretched on the earth, some on flakes of ice, many going in and out of the sea. They did not flee at our approach, never having had anything to do with man, and I reckoned that there were provisions there for hundreds of vessels. Sir, said Conseil, will you tell me the names of these creatures? They are seals and morses. It was now eight in the morning. Four hours remained to us before the sun could be observed with advantage. I directed our step toward a vast bay cut in the steep granite shore. There I can aver that earth and ice were lost to sight by the number of sea mammals covering them and I involuntarily sought for old Proteus, the mythological shepherd who watched these immense flocks of Neptune. There were more seals than anything else, forming distinct groups, male and female, the father watching over his family, the mother suckling her little ones, some already strong enough to go a few steps. When they wished to change their place, they took little jumps made by the contraction of their bodies and helped awkwardly enough by their imperfect fin, which, as with the lamatin, their congener, forms a perfect forearm. I should say that in the water, which is their element, the spine of these creatures is flexible, with smooth and close skin and webbed feet they swim admirably. In resting on the earth they take the most graceful attitudes. Thus, the ancients, observing their soft and expressive looks, which cannot be surpassed by the most beautiful look a woman can give, their clear voluptuous eyes, their charming positions, and the poetry of their manners metamorphose them the male into a triton, and the female into a mermaid. I made Conseil notice the considerable development of the lobes of the brain in these interesting cetaceans. No mammal, except man, has such a quantity of cerebral matter. They are also capable of receiving a certain amount of education, are easily domesticated, and, I think, with other naturalists that, if properly taught, they would be of great service as fishing dogs. The greater part of them slept on the rocks or on the sand. Among these seals, properly so called, which have no external ears, in which they differ from the otter whose ears are prominent, I noticed several varieties of stenorynchi, about three yards long, with a white coat. Bulldog heads armed with teeth in both jaws, four incisors at the top and four at the bottom, and two large canine teeth in the shape of a fleur de lis. Among them glided sea elephants, a kind of seal with a short flexible trunk. The giants of this species measured twenty feet round and ten yards and a half in length, but they did not move as we approached. These creatures are not dangerous? asked Conseil. No, not unless you attack them. When they have to defend their young, their rage is terrible, and it is not uncommon for them to break the fishing boat to pieces. They are quite right, said Conseil. I do not say they are not. Two miles farther on, we were stopped by the promontory which shelters the bay from the southerly winds. Beyond it, we heard loud bellowing, such as troop of ruminants would produce. Good, said Conseil, a concert of bulls. No, a concert of morses. They are fighting. They are either fighting or playing. 
we now began to climb the blackish rocks amid unforeseen stumbles and over stones which the ice made slippery. More than once I rolled over. Conseil, more prudent or more silly, did not stumble and helped me up, saying, If, sir, you would have the kindness to take wider steps, you would preserve your equilibrium better. Arrived at the upper ridge of the promontory, I saw a vast white plain covered with morses. They were playing among themselves, and what we heard were bellowings of pleasure, not of anger. As I passed near these curious animals, I could examine them leisurely, for they did not move. Their skins were thick and rugged, of a yellowish tint approaching to red. Their hair was short and scant. Some of them were four yards and a quarter long, quieter and less timid than their congeners of the north. They did not, like them, place sentinels round the outskirts of their encampment. After examining this city of Morses, I began to think of returning. It was eleven o'clock, and if Captain Nemo found the conditions favorable for observations, I wished to be present at the operation. We followed a narrow pathway running along the summit of the steep shore. At half past eleven, we had reached the place where we landed. The boat had run aground, bringing the captain. I saw him standing on a block of basalt, his instruments near him, his eyes fixed on the horizon, near which the sun was then describing a lengthened curve. I took my place beside him and waited without speaking. Noon arrived, and as before the sun did not appear. It was a fatality. Observations were still wanting. If not accomplished tomorrow, we must give up all idea of taking any. We were indeed exactly at the 20th of March. Tomorrow, the 21st, would be the equinox. The sun would disappear behind the horizon for six months, and with its disappearance, the long polar night would begin. Since the September equinox, it had emerged from the northern horizon rising by lengthened spirals up to the 21st of December. At this period, the summer solstice of the northern regions, it had begun to descend, and tomorrow was to shed its last rays upon them. I communicated my fears and observations to Captain Nemo. You are right, Monsieur Aronnax, said he. If tomorrow I cannot take the altitude of the sun, I shall not be able to do it for six months. But precisely because chance has led me into these seas on the 21st of March, my bearings will be easy to take if at twelve we can see the sun. Why, Captain? Because then the orb of day describes such lengthened curves that it is difficult to measure exactly its height above the horizon, and grave errors may be made with instruments. I shall only use my chronometer, replied Captain Nemo. If tomorrow, the 21st of March, the disk of the sun, allowing for refraction, is exactly cut by the northern horizon, it will show that I am at the South Pole. Just so, said I. But this statement is not mathematically correct, because the equinox does not necessarily begin at noon. Very likely, sir. But the error will not be a hundred yards, and we do not want more. Till tomorrow, then. Captain Nemo returned on board. Conseil and I remained to survey the shore, observing and studying until five o'clock. Then I went to bed, not, however, without invoking, like the Indian, the favor of the radiant orb. 
The next day, the 21st of March, at five in the morning, I mounted the platform. I found Captain Nemo there. The weather is lightening a little, said he. I have some hope. After breakfast, we will go on shore and choose a post for observation. That point settled, I sought Ned Land. I wanted to take him with me, but the obstinate Canadian refused, and I saw that his taciturnity and his bad humor grew day by day. After all, I was not sorry for his obstinacy under the circumstances. Indeed, there were too many seals on shore, and we ought not to lay such temptations in this unreflecting fisherman's way. Breakfast over, we went on shore. The Nautilus had gone some miles further up in the night. It was a whole league from the coast, above which reared a sharp peak about five hundred yards high. The boat took with me Captain Nemo, two men of the crew, and the instruments which consisted of a chronometer, a telescope, and a barometer. At nine we landed. The sky was brightening, the clouds were flying to the south, and the fog seemed to be leaving the cold surface of the waters. Captain Nemo went toward the peak, which he doubtless meant to be his observatory. It was a painful ascent over the sharp lava and the pumice stones in an atmosphere often impregnated with a sulfurous smell from the smoking cracks. For a man unaccustomed to walk on land, the captain climbed the steep slopes with an agility I never saw equaled, and which a hunter would have envied. We were two hours getting to the summit of this peak, which was half porphyry and half basalt. From thence we looked upon a vast sea, which, toward the north, distinctly traced its boundary line upon the sky. At our feet lay fields of dazzling whiteness. Over our heads a pale azure, free from fog. To the north the disk of the sun seemed like a ball of fire already horned by the cutting of the horizon. From the bosom of the waters rose sheaves of liquid jets by hundreds. In the distance lay the Nautilus, like a cetacean asleep on the water. Behind us, and on either hand, an immense country, and a chaotic heap of rocks and ice, the limits of which were not visible. On arriving at the summit, Captain Nemo carefully took the mean height of the barometer, for he would have to consider that in taking his observations. At a quarter to twelve, the sun, then seen only by refraction, looked like a golden disk shedding its last rays upon this deserted continent, and seas which never man had yet ploughed. Captain Nemo furnished with a lenticular glass, which by means of a mirror corrected the refraction, watched the orb sinking below the horizon by degrees, following a lengthened diagonal. I held the chronometer. My heart beat fast. If the disappearance of the half-disc of the sun coincided with twelve o'clock on the chronometer, we were at the pole itself. Twelve! I exclaimed. The South Pole, replied Captain Nemo, in a grave voice handing me the glass which showed the orb cut in exactly equal parts by the horizon. I looked at the last rays crowning the peak and the shadows mounting by degrees up its slopes. At that moment, 
Captain Nemo, resting with his hand on my shoulder, said, I, Captain Nemo, on this 21st day of March, 1868, have reached the South Pole on the 90th degree, and I take possession of this part of the globe equal to one-sixth of the known continents. In whose name, Captain? In my own, sir. Saying which, Captain Nemo unfurled a black banner bearing an N in gold quartered on its bunting. Then turning toward the orb of day, whose last rays lapped the horizon of the sea, he exclaimed, Adieu, son. Disappear, thou radiant orb. Rest beneath this open sea, and let a night of six months spread its shadows over my new domains.